First, I would like to welcome you and thank very much Jeannie Milgram for joining us. We are honored for her to, um, to be joining us. It seems like most of you know her, but I'm going to give her a little introduction anyway, even though she needs no introduction. Um, she's a genealogist and global speaker on DNA. She developed a method to trace Jewish lineages to the 1400s. She herself has done that with her family, which is one of the things she's going to be sharing with us today. And she shares in her book that I hope everybody um, saw the link that you can take a look at it, especially before our next class, so that you have a chance to kind of um, prepare. And then you can ask uh, some questions and um, Jeannie is happy to answer as she has told me. She's also the president of the Tarbuk Sfarad for Mosel in Barcelona. Um, and author of My 15 Grandmothers, which is one of the things that's going to be coming up, and that's the book that we're going to do. Um, she has spoken around the world in many different places, and we at the American Sephardi Federation Institute of Jewish Experience are very honored to have us joining her for our, um, for our new webinar series. We started last week with a tour of Egypt and the synagogues there, and now we have this two-part series. We will have another tour coming up soon. And we're very excited to go. So I know you didn't come to hear me speak. We're going to let Jeannie start. Um, please, anybody, a few different just technical issues. If you have questions, if you can please put them in the chats. Um, there are two of us here reviewing the questions. And after um, about three quarters of the way through, we'll let Jeannie know which questions have come up. Obviously, we can't answer all of them today. Um, but we'll try to pick a few that kind of um, exemplify what you have been asking. And some of them will save for next week. I hope you all come back and join us next week. So keep in mind and gather your questions for next week as well. So that even if you don't get the post it today, send me an email um, and I will post my email at the end and we will make sure that Jeannie gets the questions and we can continue with it. The other thing is please, if you have any questions, I'm uh, sorry, please, if uh, Please do not record it. That was my thing. Um, so we have people from, as we saw, most of the Western Hemisphere. So that's kind of nice. And um, we're excited to start this. Let's see how this goes. So welcome, everybody, and welcome, Jeannie, and thank you. And let's go. Take it away. Hi, it's great to be here today. I know some of you are, it's nighttime already, but uh, I'm in Miami, so it's noon, and it's a great time to do this. Um, as most of you know, I was successful in finding my own Jewish roots, going ex ex exclusively through the Catholic and Inquisition records. It's a lot of material to cover. If you would, um, most of this material is in my book, How I Found My 15 Grandmothers, which was the suggested reading. So um, a lot of you, some of this may be passing uh, information that you've already done. Uh, but basically, I, I encourage you to, to focus on perhaps what you haven't done yet. When I did mine, uh, there was no path open to be able to do this. I kind of had to learn along the way, and I finally found a method that has worked not only for me, but for others. So there's a lot of material, hunker down, and we'll get through it. So everybody has a different objective for this. Um, some people are just typical Ashkenazi uh, Jewish family. They suspect there was a Christian in her marriage somewhere along the line, and then they, they turn to finding the Jewish roots of that particular ancestor. Um, or they find all of a sudden they do a DNA test and they thought they were going to be uh, from the Incas, and all of a sudden they're 52% Ashkenaz. Or uh, some people want to get married and don't want to convert. And, and, and again, that is mostly what I hear. I get hundreds of emails all the time. And mostly what I'm hearing is that people do not want to go through the conversion process and they just want to attach themselves to the Jewish people via finding their lineage. That is a whole different ball game that we're, you know, we don't want to get into right now of who is a Jew, does it work that way, doesn't it work that way. Here, we're just gonna deal with the people that are looking to find their Jewish ancestry. So the first thing that you really need to do, like immediately, if not sooner, is have questions for the elders of the family. 
do not put this off. And especially now that in these times that we see how very fragile we are as a people, it's time to sit down with your elders. I know a lot of them may have Alzheimer's, but through the Alzheimer's and through the dementia and through the illness or whatever the correct word is, there's still some key questions. And it's important that you record everything because and if you can't record it that you just take copious notes because something that may not be important today will be important later so were there a lot of cousin intermarriages did the family have unusual rituals or customs so people will say yeah we used to change the beds on friday so you might think okay so you have to change the beds one day a week so what's the big deal you change them on Fridays, and that might not seem like a big deal, but that's a huge deal, because a lot of the people in the Inquisition, and believe me, these customs were passed down to me from the Inquisition. I read the Inquisition documents of my family, and people were killed for changing the beds on Friday. So even though it seems silly, you have to focus on everything that someone is telling you, where there's special cooking or different customs, in my case, my family always taught me, my grandmothers, to check for blood in the eggs. Now, maybe other people check for blood in the eggs. I'm not saying that that was just me, but basically that was a big giveaway. They were um, checking the vegetables, also uh, looking for bugs, which is something that we do. So you have to ask everything. What type of work the family was in? And this is important. My family was always in haberdashery and they were um, in uh, cloth. So that was on my maternal side, that was the Jewish side. Never were they anything except back in the 1400s, except in ribbon cloth and this type of thing. Um, did they own shops or businesses? If they did, try to get the names. You can always research the names later. Was the family religious? Did they go to church on Sunday? This is important. For example, my sister and I, who went to Catholic school all of our lives from, from you know, kindergarten through me in my case, college, they would drop us off at church on Sundays. And we thought it was normal, but we would look around and everyone was with the parents and the grandparents. And there we were by our house with no family being dropped off to church with us. So, that's very important was the family religious. Um, did anyone ever light candles on a Friday night or maybe once a year? Because we light candles once a year um, in different holidays to commemorate our dead uh, that have gone before us. Or did they prepare a special meal on Friday nights or Saturday for lunch? All of these questions, and I'm sure that you can think of a lot more because there is a lot of material to cover, but these are just some of the way to get you started. Um, normally, I wouldn't start asking anything about Jews because the minute, and I know in my own family and in other families, from what I hear from other people, the minute you try to find out anything about Jewish in a really Catholic family, they're gonna shut you out, totally shut out. So stick with the name things, see the name to them and are actually crucial to you. Um, family history, was there a day of the year that they wore only white? For centuries, uh, my family would only wear white on the fast of Purim because they were no longer observing the fast of, of Yom Kippur. So they were fasting on Purim. Um, was there a family culture of fasting? Did anyone ever mention Jewish ancestry? You need to dance around that one. Uh, you, I, I mean, if your relative is willing to openly talk about it, then of course, by all means, but by and large, they're not. Did you ever hear of a shawl being placed around the shoulders of a couple being married? This actually happened to me in my first wedding when I married in a Catholic church that my mom and my grandmother pinned this family shawl over our shoulders, which is a Sephardic custom. Did anyone ever touch or kiss the doorway? Do um, You can show the family if they're open to it, Again, don't push. This may take a few sessions with the elders. Show them pictures of the Hebrew alphabet, a hamsa, a menorah, star of David, 
the menorah is the most common, especially if you show pictures of an old menorah um, that is uh, carved into a wall. You can find these on the internet. Um, did they ever see or hear anyone mention that children were not baptized? In my family, most of the records show that the babies were too ill to be baptized and everyone lived. So they were not taken to the church. So these are telltale things. Do you know the name of the village in Spain or Portugal that the family came from? Believe me, this is crucial. If you're from Peru or Venezuela, or you are from Cuba like I am, or Puerto Rico, or wherever you're from, it's very difficult to get records to take you out of the country. That means to find the last ancestor that made their way into Cuba, or Puerto Rico. You want to get going. The meat of all of this is somewhere in Spain or Portugal. So it's crucial to know. And it may be that if you ask the names of the businesses, I was helping someone with this who was from Venezuela and the family had been from the border with Venezuela and Colombia. And they had a huge uh, acres and acres of a farm or estancia for horses. And the name of the Estancia was the name of a Portuguese village. And that's why I said at the onset that it's important if you're able to get the names of the businesses, because sometimes it's incorporated into the family business name and nobody's really paid attention. The, the last one, the box of old letters, papers, and pictures, that's the mother load, right? Everyone wishes they could find it. That's like, if you don't have anything that, that's it. I did find, uh, but I only found it way after I had already um, done the work. And uh, for those that don't know my story, I did convert at a very young age uh, back to uh, Orthodox Judaism. I converted out of a conviction to be Jewish and only learned many, many years later that I was Jewish from birth via all of this that I'm showing you now. Uh, there's a lot of challenge with names, and if you're a male, we can be a little bit more lenient, I'll use that word, in taking your name as being a name that comes from the past. However, do not, do not, for one second, pay attention to all those lists that have come out. Are you on this list? That means that you're Jewish. A lot of these lists were put together by lawyers that wanted people to come and do the Spanish citizenship. They were done in a way that, that there's no backing to them because in the 8,000 people that I have found in my own lineage, going back to 1405, I promise you that I have every Spanish name known to man. My family name from my dad is Medina. From my mom, it's Ramis. And I have Ramos and Martinez, name Gomez Garcia, you name it, it's on my tree. When I get further back, all of the names that are the Portuguese, Santos, Dos Santo, Coelho, Pereira, all of the Portuguese names. So obviously, a name alone is enough. Um, the name changes, constant, insulated the families a family would use or buy an old Christian Spanish name. Names were randomly selected when a person converted. Names were made up. So this, yes, a lot of people talk about names being topographical, flowers, animals, or like my grandmother's last name was Flores, which means flowers, or Ramos, which means bouquet. So the reality is, is that yes, these names all exist in my family, but so do the old Christian names. Um, it's not enough to assume that one descends from a Jewish lineage if you have one of these names. It's a good starting point, but 600 years is a long, long time to go without a change. Surnames of today are very different from 1492 and most certainly from the late 1300s. Uh, how I found, and this is good in your searches, that the first names rarely changed. So you went from being Jose Garcia to Jose Martinez to Jose Menendez to Jose, or you might call yourself Jose Juan or Jose Maria, but you would always keep Jose. Um, 
the surname was taken either from the mother or the father. Anything was done to hide from the Inquisition who the real family was. Sometimes the first names of the grandparents were used as surnames. So let's say the grandfather's name was Huang, and uh, now your name used to be Jose Menendez, and all of a sudden you would call yourself Jose Huang. So basically, uh, be careful with the names. Don't get too excited, and make sure that you're following the right family when you get started with this. They're looking to have on each person that you find as much from this list as you can. Birth certificate or baptism certificate. Back in the day in Spain and Portugal, baptism and birth certificate were the same thing. A marriage certificate, a death certificate, notary records. Notary records are super important and easier to find if the church, everybody tells me, church burned down. Well, that's just like it is here in the States. <clears throat> Your church burns down, but you still have a social security record. So there's state records and there's church records. So notary records are when you were selling a piece of land or when you were, um, let's say, uh, somebody stole you, there would be a notary record and that has names. It would say, Juan Menendez, it actually says things like Juan Menendez, who used to be the Jew Cohen, is, uh, is selling his land at such and such a place. So these records actually kept showing that people were Jewish back in the day. Um, all references found on the internet and Sephardic uh, as to the Jewishness of last name. And uh, in the second part of this, I will go over which are the reliable ones as to the Jewishness. And again, I use the word Jewishness with a huge grain of salt because not always um, was it really Jewish. It could have been bought. Uh, occupation, special skills, musical talent, uh, newspaper clippings. The occupations in my case were what was able to take me over the edge with my family because you have a goldsmith and it's that goldsmith is going to excel at his job and it's going to be rare that all of a sudden that goldsmith astrologer i mean really so i was following the goldsmiths so if i would lose track at some point in the process then i would track their job i would look for the butchers i would look for the silversmiths i would look for the shoemakers or the goldsmith. So for me, following the occupations and following the first names began my two lines of defense. Pictures, believe it or not, if you go on Google and you go to more, Google has a lot of things underneath, all videos, images, and things like that. Well, there's one called more. And when you go down, there is a section that's called books. And believe it or not, there uh, I have found drawings from the 1600 of family members that stopped on their way to Cuba. They stopped in Jamaica, and there's actual drawings in these antique books. And Inquisition references to the last name. Again, important, but to be taken with a grain of salt. I know how excited we can get as we're looking back, but with a grain of salt. These are the kind of records that we're looking at. And uh, this record, one of these records here, the second one, threw me off for a very long time because the name used to be Guerrero and then they moved to Spain and they forged it. And it says Herrero. So I kept looking for the Herrero family to go back until I started studying this particular record. And it was this record that helped me to find uh, a DNA exact match at the 14th generation because he was Guerrero and mine was Herrero and I was stuck. So these records, make sure they're not forged over. You can see the mess, it's forged. And uh, when they're forged, try to get a different record or try to read through the record and get to the reality of it. Um, these are the best sites for names only research. And what did I say? Don't do names only, but because that's our instinct sephardicgen.com, jewishgen.org, and the third website is 
my own free. It's, uh, it's called supportagainstistry.com. And this is where I have been uploading for the last years, five, six. I have been uploading only first um, with, with, with first uh, records, meaning they are like, they can't get any better directly from Inquisition files. I have been uploading names for the Inquisition of Lima, Peru, the Inquisition of Colón in Chile. I have been uploading the names once they went to Amsterdam and everything has its primary source. I only work with primary source. I stay away from websites um, that people are putting up trees and other people are changing them. Um, for us, that doesn't work. It's great for other kinds of genealogy, but not for ours. We are literally trying to come back or to find, and I don't know about everyone else, but I'm not in this for fairy tales. I want to know the truth. If I have the ancestry, great, that's what I'm looking for. But if I don't have it, I don't want to just make it up. So basically, in Sephardic Ancestry, you can check all the marriages in Amsterdam in 14, uh, 1596. It will tell you where they came from in Portugal and Spain and where they moved on from there. This print screen was, um, Sephardim.com was a very reliable uh, website and the gentleman, uh, Stein, he died a couple of years ago. Sephardim Gen took it up. And why is this so important? Because it gives you, and you can find this under other databases on Sephardic Gen, this print screen, as you can see, each name has a series of initials and letters behind it. And it will say, it was used in the Inquisition of Toledo. It was used uh, in the Inquisition of the Canary Islands. And it was used as a Jewish name because it was a Jewish butcher. In other words, if your name is on here and it says it was, you, and you've hit a brick wall and it says it was used in the Inquisition of Toledo or here or there or elsewhere, you will be able to have a new path from your brick wall on how to search. So this is a crucial um, what database and I'm very happy that uh, Jeff Malka at Sephardic Gen uh, he did take this on and he moved very quickly when this gentleman died and the wife agreed to share this with everyone. It's a lifetime work. Um, this is my website that contains many, many, many tables with actual names from the Inquisition file. And I continuously upload. I'm still working a lot on the Canary Islands. And, um, but you can find a wealth of information on this website. Um, there's a screen uh, here of the biographies that are used for the names that you find. So it's very interesting because then you can read, not biographies, I'm sorry, bibliographies. Then you can read these bibliographies and find things that you may otherwise not be able to find. Um, internet searches, you have to cover all angles. You absolutely must uh, find historical Jewish context of the name and you have to do these in all languages. Ramos being the name of my grandfather, I would search Ramos Judío Converso, Nombre Judío, Converso Jew, Jewish name, Spanish Inquisition, and then I would go into other languages. Ramos Heraldry, I would go Ramos Nom Juif to get it in French, Nom Judaico Ramos, I would try to do it because Maybe you think it was from Spain or Portugal, but maybe it was from Italy. And I know that I'm covering a lot of material and I'm covering it extremely fast, but basically you can go back and see on the Facebook Live, you can go back and see this. You just have to look, for example, we no longer use the word Murano because it's very, very insulting to people like me. Some of the returnees or converso descendants, crypto Jews, not mind the word Murano, but, but I do. For example, it is a name that means pig, that other Jews were calling the converted Jews when they were really Catholic. So I, however, it's a real word and there are uh, important informations to find with it. 
you have to look for forums on specific names. Foro, apellido Ramos, Foro, apellido Menendez. Do it in Spanish, do it in English. There's people that are out there looking for the names. And by the way, Google changes constantly, meaning if you look yesterday and I add something new today, you won't see me. You have to check constantly for books, for things. People upload ancient books. I do buy a lot of books uh, that are antique books that are out of print. My library, uh, my physical library is very large. I have over 400 volumes of uh, places where names could be found and not just names, names attached to the Inquisition. Every single little village in Portugal has printed such a book and they've been given money to do so. I have these books and these books, if you ever want me to look up a specific name from a specific town or a nearby town, I'm always very open to doing this. I do not do genealogy work for anyone. What I do is I help you find your path and I help you go in a direction that you can that you can go. If I feel that you can continue on your own, then I will tell you how to continue on your own. If I feel that you have reached a place where you need to hire a professional, I will tell you that also. And I really only rely on maybe three people in the world um, that I'm comfortable with on really giving you the correct information. I have one in Spain. I have one in Portugal and I have one in Cuba. Outside of that, I don't really uh, have anything. Um, a lot of people ask me, what about Honduras? What about this? What I can tell you is that if you are in Central America and upper South America, Colombia, eh, Venezuela, um, and, and I think that that would be about it, you should be checking very thoroughly into the Mexican Inquisition. In you are in the Caribbean area, you will generally, and again, this is general, there's no, you have to know history to know where to look. So if you're in the Caribbean area, and you will generally, if it's a Spanish country like Cuba or Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic, you would normally have to be going back to Spain and Portugal. However, if you are in the English speaking, Jamaica, Aruba, St. Eustatius, uh, these type of places, your relatives probably arrived. They went from Spain to Portugal, probably to Amsterdam and to London and from there down into the Caribbean. If you are in the Southern cone of South America, you will probably be looking at the Inquisition of Lima, Peru, and Cartagena, Colombia. So everyone is going to be looking in a different area because of course there's gonna be exceptions, but by and large, everyone um, more or less follow these patterns. The Inquisition in Mexico, uh, I'm gonna use this term even as it's bothering me, if you are lucky enough, that your family was in the Mexican Inquisition, you've gained a hundred years on the process because you, instead of having to look back at 1405 like me, you were, you'd be looking at 1550. So you gained about a hundred years, so you're actually a lot closer to be able to do this. Uh, Facebook. Facebook is an amazing forum. Um, you know, Facebook isn't just for, look, look at my dish, look, I ate today, or now today it's a pictures of Easter eggs with face masks. But it's really a rich environment for finding information. There are not just like, see, Apellido Ramos, I look for forums and you can see all of the different people searching for Ramos, looking for Ramos. And once again, I suggest that at the onset of your search, you're not talking Jewish. You, you don't need to be talking Jewish until you get back closer to the Inquisition because the minute that you start and you bring up Jewish, I had a, a DNA uh, match 
that was really up there. We shared about 36% DNA and I had no idea who this woman was. And I made the huge mistake of mentioning Jewish. I put a, a link to my website and I, I wasn't thinking, I'm telling you, don't do it. And this woman disappeared. She erased herself from the uh, Spanish, from Puerto Rico. She erased herself from, I don't know how, from my DNA screen. She took me off her Facebook. She's gone. She would have been an amazing, amazing resource. I made that mistake early, early on. So be very careful. Um, and it's not that people are anti-Semitic, because I know that's like the next question. Are people anti-Semitic? No. What is going on is that generally people will be so scared that it's a Pandora box. It really, from what I have seen, and I've gotten through to people that are frightened, it's a Pandora box. They just don't want to open that box. And um, here are, at FamilySearch.org, there's special collections of the churches. Below, um, here's a sample. I was able to find my paternal grandmother all the way back to the 1600s. So um, her name was Dora Pais. And finally, I was able to find when she went all the way to um, the family was French. So in FamilySearch.org, uh, they are constantly, these are the Mormons, they are constantly um, uploading. I've seen them at the archives, uploading, uploading, uploading. So uh, check back often. They have churches from all over the world. Here, we're generally concerned with the Latin American, Costa Rica, from Puerto Rico, from Colombia, just wherever. It's an amazing resource to find because remember, there's no Jewish records. There's no marriage contracts and there's no ketubas. There's, there's no cemeteries. So what do we have? We have the notary. Uh, we have this, which is just incredible. And we have to go back with what we have. And that would be the Catholic Church until you go far enough that you're ready to go into the Inquisition records. Uh, Arbutsefarad.com uh, is in Barcelona, the most amazing resource that you could ever want to get involved in. On the right-hand side, you will see just about every uh, village in Spain, and you click on it, and you will get the... Um, the representative of that village. I'm the representative for the village of my ancestors of Permoseye, and I will post, and my email is there, as are all of these other people. Their emails are there, and you can contact them. They are the ones that are researching day in and out the Jewish portion of, you know, getting out of the Spanish uh, customs and the Spanish history. They're the ones that are researching the Jewish history. So this is great. You can talk Jewish all you want over here. And it's a great resource. And I highly suggest these people, everyone, they are know-it-alls. It's amazing. Everybody knows it all. And um, the last thing I want to cover today is that it is really important to know where were the permanent inquisition tribunals? This is very, the reason this is so important is that if your family happens to be from one of these places, I can pretty much tell you that you have it made um, because the records were right there. So if your family was in Cordoba, you can see the years. So for example, if you are at 1500 or I'm sorry, 1600, you wouldn't be searching in Cordoba because it only got established in 1482. In Portugal, the inquisitions, these years are extremely important so that you don't go searching before they were ready. Coimbra and uh, Evora, Lisbon, Porto, uh, Lamego and Tomar, and then Goa in India. And then, of course, the Inquisition moved over to Mexico City, Lima, Peru, Cartagena, Colombia. However, that's where there was an Inquisition that would be actively 
having the judgment. There were Inquisition offices all over Brazil and in, um, in every, like in Panama, there was an Inquisition, there was offices, but those offices would question you, they'd bring you in, and if they thought that you merited it, they'd shove you off to one of these jails. So the big Inquisition where they would actually burn you and they, where they would kill you and where they would start writing all your history would be in one of these places. Outside of these places, they would move you um, over, and it doesn't mean that there weren't, it just means that um, this is where, you know, ground zero. So the history is very important. It's very important to understand the diaspora of what was going on. Uh, where were the families? What were they doing? So I think that we are going to stop here for today and uh, get to some questions. Great. So, so what I'm gonna breathe. Mean, I'm gonna breathe for like a minute. Yes. Take a drink. Everybody will let you. Um, just anyway. In the meantime, if you did not type in your question, I know somebody raised their hand. So if you could please type in your question, because um, we can't open up the microphone when you have this many people. It's just um, easier this way. Um, so the the biggest question that's been coming up is about the websites that you've been posting and i know that you've been putting them here i don't know if you will allow them to uh, get the slides of them others uh, that may be available that's one of the big questions i know that's a simple question but okay yes if you uh would like uh to receive most this information is in my book how i found my 15 grandmothers that book is available on kindle it's practically mirroring this along with other questions. It's in English and Spanish. And uh, I, I, it would be good if you could pick it up. It's available in, in paperback or on Kindle for $4.99. So all of this is available. And in English, how I found my 15 grandmothers and in Spanish, como encontré a mis, a mis 15 abuelas. And both languages are in the same book. So, right, so I, and I posted those in the chat. So anybody who wants to go back, I put the links in the chat. Um, but in terms of the websites, right, we can share those. The, um, the other question- you know, I'm sorry, the website, you mean Sephardic Ancestry? That's yeah. totally free, SephardicAncestry.com. You can go- The list there. you had for sites, the Sephardi uh, Gen and- Right, all of those, those are free websites and SephardicAncestry.com. That is mine where I personally have been uploading. So the question is if you just have them written out somewhere that I can send them tomorrow. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll get them to okay. you. So we can send that to everybody. That's not a problem. Um, Judy's have, hitting a brick wall in the 1700s approximately. Um, do you know anywhere that it's particularly bigger in the 1700s? Where, where is she in the 1700s? That I have to know. <laughs> Judy, can you type where you're from? I did ask some people to elaborate, but. I know that there are a few people posting here specific names um, and tracing them. And it, like you said, the easiest way would be to start with those Judy, names on the Puerto website. Rico. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has its set of challenges. However, there are Puerto Rican specialists in the world. There's one in Israel and um, it's, it's very important that in Puerto Rico, uh, if you want, contact me later. I can put you in touch with the person that has been researching Puerto Rico quite effectively all her life, and she will be able to uh, guide you from there. Um, okay, and then there are specific questions here, so I'm not sure, Th those are the general questions. Um, a lot of them are about names, so if you want to just make, make mention of the difficulty in approaching you about a specific name and where to possibly right, start. Right. I talked a little bit about the names. You know, names are very difficult. You found your name on a list on the website, on a website, and it says, you know, are you Sephardic? Look at these 8,000 names. Mm -hmm. And the reality, and there's books even written like that. If there is no historical attachment to it, um, it it's very difficult. Uh, you really have to do, I, 
I hate to say it because I would have hated hearing me when I was doing this. You really have to do the work. And a lot of people say, but how do you start? How do you start? I'll tell you how you start. You start by writing your name on a piece of paper. Then you write the names of your parents. Then you write whatever grandparents you know. And I'm here to tell you that you will find so much more than you think you know. But if you don't write your name on a piece of paper and write the names of your parents, you probably aren't going to get anywhere. You're going to have to do this. I did this for years on a big, um, you know, one of those big sheets of, of lined graph paper. And I would put the names on post-it notes, pink post-it notes for the women and blue post-it notes for the men and yellow if I was unsure. And then um, I would be changing them because as time went on and I got real information, I was wrong. So I held, I had this huge thing on my table for years where I was just moving them until I was sure and then I would input it. But that's the way to start. Put down the first name on paper. Okay, and Curtis is asking if you know of any um, continuation into Belarus. He has DNA matches in Belarus. If you've heard of any Spanish group and a possibility Sephardi? of having research. Sephardi. Sephardi. Right. I will get the name of a person that has done a lot of research on that, and I will get that to you, um, Dora, and you can pass it on. It's a I woman that speaks every year at IHAGS, and uh, her specialty is following these families into Poland and into countries that are typically Ashkenaz. Excellent. So, Curtis, I hope you heard that, and I will follow up with you on that. Um, so Brian, yeah, Bri uh, Brian is asking, with what minimum percentage DNA identified as Iberian Peninsula should someone start to consider a bona fide Spartic background? You know, that's a very difficult um, question. That's probably the most difficult question I've had today because just because it's not showing any percentage or a low percentage that some DNA experts would consider noise, three, four, five percent, some experts consider noise, I don't because remember that DNA and DNA testing is about self-identification. So if you have a lot of people from Morocco that used to be Sephardic Jews and they are not self-identifying as Jews, when your, I, I, when your DNA comes out, it's going to show a high incidence of North Africa, Morocco, and it's not going to show uh, because they didn't self-identify as Jews. That's still one of the, the let's say, problems uh, or challenges that we have with DNA testing today, that the self-identification. I take very seriously matches that are very high, like my own family, I believe, is uh, depending on mom or dad, between 52 and 72 percent Spain and Portugal. From there, I have a lot of matches in Israel, and I even have matches with the Bedouins. I have matches in North Africa, and um, the whole combination of the diaspora of the Spanish Jews is really important. I have a very high incidence in Greece, so it would tell me that, that my family at some point did go to Greece, and uh, my mom has 48% uh, Sephardic. And, I'm sorry, she has 48% of which I believe 32 or something like that is Sephardic and the rest is Ashkenaz. Although believe me, I have not found the Ashkenaz and I have every piece of paper on my mom. So I don't know who they are. I'm sure they're there and my dad as well. My son tested with a 25% um, Sephardic. I only had 20, uh, 18%. So it, it, it all depends, it just, depends. So I don't take, I don't invalidate a low number ever. So after that difficult question, I'm going to ask you a fun light question. Is that oh, a screen please. photo or are you actually in a library? <laughs> That's from Bonnie. <laughs> Bonnie wants to know if you're no, actually in a library. I am. This library behind me is a library in, um, in, in Portugal and uh, it's either in Portugal or in Jamaica. I have to look at it closer. I am not in library. I am sitting in a room and I didn't want you to see my cats while walking back and forth. 
So yes, it was either this or downtown Taipei. Um, so we have a few questions. Actually, Joe asked if you have any information on Palamos near Girona. Um, any Jews from Palamos, if you've heard of them? No, actually, Joe, I haven't. Um, do you have family from there? I'll wait for an answer. We'll wait, we'll, well come back to him if he types in it event, in. Um, Rabbi Barbara Aiello, who is uh, in uh, Calabria, has helped a lot of people uh, find their um, roots from Italy. I do not have these Italian roots, so basically I, I have done personally very little research, but I know that Rabbi Barbara has, and I can put Joe, I can put you in touch with her if I haven't already at some point. Okay, well, Joan also had a question about the Spanish Jews who came from Italy. So if you have someone who, no, oh, sorry, who, who, who came from Spain to Italy, my apologies. <laughs> right, who, who went to Italy. Although you have to realize that Italy had its own uh, group. In other words, um, we cannot assume the Italian Jews were coming from Spain. Italian Jews were like in place. Uh, they were there for a very long time. So some did go, but mostly what happened is that they would go uh, after the expulsion, they would go to uh, the Ottoman Empire, Salonica, they would go, and then they would go to Italy. So it was kind of a roundabout way. I uh, don't believe they went direct for the most part. And a lot of them did go to France though. France and that whole uh, Bordeaux area, that's very telling with the Spanish Jews. Right, so she, she was actually asking about Livorno, which does have a fairly large- uh, Right, exactly. Spanish, but um, you're, you're right. Actually, one of the clips we just did on the Institute is about the Roman community that's been there since the temple times, so. Um, exactly. Italy has very old communities. And I didn't watch, and I didn't, and I didn't watch the clip. <laughs> uh, well, See, now you should go back and watch it. Um, okay, another question. Uh, what testing companies will be more helpful? Do you have a specific one? She, this person said she tested with both FTDNA um, and MTDNA and Ancestry. Uh, thus far, all the matches are from Puerto Rico, but is there a better testing company or does it make a difference? Have you found one more than the other? Well, I, I think that Ancestry and 23andMe are not too helpful for this. Um, they are more dedicated. Remember that you're, you're looking at the pool that's testing. So if they, the people that are testing are all from Central America, for example, then you'd be hard pressed to find an Israeli that tested over there that you're going to match. I, if you tested with, um, with family tree DNA and you did the family finder test with family tree, mm -hmm. I suggest that you upload those results to my heritage. My heritage in Israel um, has been, uh, is incredible in that they have been able to isolate seven diff uh, five different types of Jews. Um, heritage, the Mizrahi, the Ethiopian, the Sephardic, uh, Ashkenaz, and the Yemenite Jews. So it's a lot easier uh, via uh, my heritage in Israel. Okay, and unfortunately, uh, another question is typed in Spanish and I don't speak Spanish. So Marisol, if you want to type the question in English or I don't know if you she can, can ask me if you can unmute her. Right, to unmute one person in this, we can try. But I think it's easier if she just types it in English or you can open up the questions and answers on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I have, there's a lot of people here, so I don't know. No, just go to the bottom. She's the bottom one. Let me see. Um, no, I, I don't see it. Okay. So we'll do that. Um, hopefully she'll send it to us next time. And okay. Well, those are the questions. Oops, did we lose? I don't see her. Are you still there, Jeannie? Nope. We lost Jeannie. Well, then I'm going to tell everybody, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, 
I'm going to say thank you very much for coming, for joining the American Sephardi Federation Institute of Jewish Experience webinar. I hope that you do take a look at the book and you... Uh, I lost you, but here I am on my phone. Oh, good. I was just saying thank you to everybody for coming. So No, I you will notice that on my phone, I am not in a library. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Beautiful flowers. Well, we're going to... Um, oh, wait. There were two more, maybe Marisol rewrote. I'm just gonna check. Uh, let me see. Right. Um, I don't see Marisol, but Marisol, you can write me in Spanish at uh, via my um, on my website, geniemilgram.com, and you can write me there. I, I will get your question. Y me puedes escribir en español en cualquier idioma que quieres, y yo te puedo contestar desde ahí. Um, okay, and we will definitely answer some of these questions next time as well. I'm going to put my um, I'm going to put my email address at, in the chat so that everybody can take a look and email me with any questions for next time or for um, in general. I will also, if I forget to send you the information, I will follow up with um, Jeannie. Also. Um, I also, yeah, well, me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dora. I, I think it would be fantastic if your homework for the next week is to write your name on a piece of paper and mm -hmm. just see how much you know, because you probably know more than you think you know, and it's really important. Um, this is not your typical genealogy sort of search. When you're doing this, you are gathering a lot of history and you're gathering evidence, you're gathering circumstantial evidence. So you should uh, theoretically, like I did, I have a folder on each of my 22 grandmothers. I didn't bother with the men. For me, I wanted to um, do this a different way. So basically I just have a folder on each woman. Um, okay, and I just wanted to mention that Tiago asked about the Amsterdam synagogue. Uh, that's something that if you want, you should definitely contact me directly. We have contacts with the Amsterdam, with the Snoga in Amsterdam, and we would love to, um, to follow up with that. Jeannie also is featured on our course in, um, if you go into Institute of Jewish Experience, Dot org. We have MOOCs there, and so she has one little thing there, not as much as she's giving you here, but it's also, it's about finding your identity and the concept of who you are and um, what it means if you're outwardly one thing and inwardly another thing. And I think many people in this uh, group are struggling with that on their own. So it's an interesting kind of exploration to see through that. Um, and I really, really appreciate you doing this workshop for us. Jeannie, is there anything you want to say before we sign off? No, we're good. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's name on a piece of paper next week. <laughs> we'll find a way for everybody to hold it up. And please, if we did not answer your question today and it's not about a particular name, please send me an email and we'll try to get to it next week. Throughout the week also, please be sure to, um, to send it as you get through them and we'll try to get through as many as possible. And everybody have a happy holiday today. Happy holiday. Thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure. Enjoy. It was, thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.